I know my favorite story is that he walked off. He walked off his plantation in Maryland as a young 20-year-old. Is he 20? His, his partner, a woman friend, and he created a sailor costume for him. And he, in essence, walked off the plantation, got on a ship, and came to New Bedford. Uh, my name is John Spack. I'm the executive director at Discovering Justice, where we are honored to have the Moakley Courthouse as our home. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Not sure if you have plans, um, but wanted to wish you a happy Valentine's Day and a happy 200th birthday to Frederick Douglass. Um, we will be learning a lot about Frederick Douglass um, uh, today. Um, and it's so great to see so many folks here today. Um, we see a lot of incredible folks, mostly adults. Um, and while I do see mostly adults, uh, Discovering Justice, um, our work here is largely uh, working with children, young children as early as kindergarten through eighth grade. <coughs> Frederick Douglass said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Through Discovering Justice, our, our programs on uh, civics and justice education, we're preparing young people to take up his mantle by empowering them to become courageous leaders and good stewards of democracy. We're doing this with students, as I said, as early as kindergarten. And now I just want to turn it over. It's my honor to introduce um, Judge Douglas Woodlock, um, whose vision and passion for law, architecture, history um, has brought us here today. Welcome. It would be an honor under any circumstances for the Boston Federal Courts to host this event. My two organizations productively and with great success engaged in the project of raising the level of consciousness and civic engagement towards civic education. It's particularly privileged to do so today when we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the day that Frederick Douglass, who is the subject of a fascinating ongoing exhibit at the Museum of African American History, designated as his birthday. He didn't really know what his birthday was, uh, but he said that his uh, mother thought that he was her little Valentine, and so he chose February 14th uh, as his birth date. We're doing so uh, in the midst of the 20th anniversary year of the founding of Discovering Justice, but the question should be asked, what, why are we doing this in a courthouse, in this courthouse? Some of you uh, may be literally sitting on the answer. Uh, it's in this little book. It's a book that uh, tells you about the system of inscriptions that we have at the courthouse. Uh, and as John said, uh, the courthouse is also uh, celebrating its 20th anniversary. This is the first of a series of uh, programs that we'll be presenting this year in conjunction with Discovering Justice that will talk about the aspirations of the building. But there is no aspiration uh, higher than this building's system of inscriptions. Nothing is more important, I think, to facilitating an understanding about what the purposes of the law and uh, justice is than to look at each of these inscriptions. And if you look at this, I won't test you afterwards, but you should study this uh, pamphlet. If you look at the pamphlet, it's got an introduction by Tony Lewis, who you probably remember as Chief Justice Marshall's uh, husband, the great reporter uh, for the Supreme Court and columnist for the New York Times. And he said that each of the inscriptions, you've seen them all around the building, is a separate reflection about the law. They are history, they are passion, Together, they form a discussion about what the law can and should do in a free society. They are, he tells us, a democratic conversation. Among the inscriptions, none has had a greater impact on passersby, in my experience. And none poses a greater challenge to all of us in assessing whether we are living up to our aspirations than the one you will find on page 10 of the pamphlet. Page 10 of the pamphlet has the quotation from Frederick Douglass, that it is carved along our old Northern Avenue wall. In that uh, quotation, I won't quote the quotation, but just to paraphrase, what Douglass does is he warns that the law, when the law permits any segment of society to feel disenfranchised, the very foundations of justice are put at risk. This program today is central to what the courthouse stands for. In the words of another quotation in this building, the one that's up on the wall to my left there, a long quotation from Louis Brandeis, it's a reflection of our commitment to the idea, the proposition that public discussion is a political duty and should be a fundamental principle 
of the American government, and perhaps more than any of the quotations in this building, that of Frederick Douglass frames our public discussion about the fundamental principles of American government. By presentations from our four commentators in a panel discussion following which we hope all of you participate with questions and comments, the program will seek to capture his image, the passion of his language. It will touch on the history of his concerns played out not altogether admirably in this Boston federal court during the fugitive slave law era while Douglas came to prominence before the Civil War. It will address the question of equity today in the sentencing practices that the federal courts use. I suspect it will not be an altogether comfortable conversation. I suspect, however, it is, in fact, I'm certain, it will advance our understanding of what the law means to a democratic society. Before turning to Professor Stauffer, our keynote speaker, I want to celebrate someone who is not here today. He's on the cover uh, of the pamphlet. It's a fellow by the name of John Brents Benson. He's the craftsman who supervised our inscription program, and you see him in action right here. John was the craftsman who designed and carved the inscriptions on the grave site of President Kennedy at Arlington Cemetery. Among other projects, he was responsible for the lettering of the Vietnam War Memorial and the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in Washington and the Civil Rights Mu uh, Museum, or Memorial, excuse me, in Montgomery, Alabama. Most recently, his shop, which is now run by his son, Nick, was responsible for the carving and lettering of the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, D.C. His life's work has given tangible expression to our nation's democratic conversation, but unfortunately, an important family matter has him in Santa Fe, New Mexico, today. But you can hear his craft through this discussion. And now let me turn the program over to our keynote, Professor John Stauffer of Harvard, uh, whose book, Picturing uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, is a catalog of the program that is exhibition that's at the Museum of African American History. And in fact, uh, Professor Stauffer was the curator there. Professor Stauffer. So Douglas is, this is Douglas's, Frederick Douglass's 200th birthday. He thought he was born in 1817. Uh, from what his mother told him, but we know it was February of 1818 because the Y plantation in the account log, it says after his name, February of 1818, uh, which was discovered by Dixon Preston, the great journalist and uh, biographer of the young Frederick Douglass in the 1980s. Douglas, uh, as most of you know, was the preeminent African American of the 19th century. Uh, he was the uh, he published three autobiographies, two of them best-selling. He was one of the preeminent orators uh, in the United States, and in fact, he could command a higher speaking fee than any other figure, white or black. Emerson is often seen as one of the great orators, but Douglas could command a higher speaking fee than Emerson. And this was a time where its public speaking was one of the few forms of entertainment. People would come from all around. The best way to understand a public speaker then was being similar to a movie star, or a hip hop star, or a professional athlete today. Uh, he was truly uh, a household name beginning after the success of his first autobiography, the beautiful 90-page lyrical narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, he was better known, more famous, more widely read than Lincoln until 1860. Uh, in that sense, he was truly one of the preeminent um, Americans of his day, not just African Americans. And indeed, when he died in 1895, a number of leading newspapers, white newspapers, referred to him as one of, if not the most significant figure in the United States in the last 50 years. Let me quote from the Chicago Tribune. Like today, Chicago P Tribune then chiefly wrote for white audience and it said after Douglas died, no man, black or white, has been better known for nearly half a century in this country than Frederick Douglass. And yet, by the early 20th century, because white Southerners gained control of the story of the Civil War, 
denied the fact that the Civil War was about slavery, denied the degree to which racism simply marinated American society. Their stories of the Civil War necessarily needed to ignore African Americans, ignore black abolitionists, because if the Civil War is not about slavery, but rather about states' rights, or rather about the northern aggression, these lunatic abolitionists who are making Southerners feel uncomfortable as Americans, what do you do with someone like Frederick Douglass? What do you do with someone like William Lloyd Garrison who emphasizes the degree to which slavery and racism are America's original sin and that everyone at the time recognized that secession and the war stemmed from slavery. In fact, Lincoln in his inaugural address in 1861 said there is only one substantial dispute between you Southerners, us Northerners, and that is you believe slavery is a positive good, a good thing that should allow, uh, should allow to, be, to expand. We believe it's evil that should be contained. And so as a result, for most of the 20th century, Douglas was unread by whites. He come, he's out of print from roughly 1905 until 1948 when Benjamin Quarles, the great African-American historian, brings his first narrative back into print. And then two years later, uh, Philip Foner publishes The Life and Letters of Frederick Douglass in a five-volume uh, collection which was published by the international publishers, the communist press of the United States which circulates only about 1,000 copies. It's literally not until about the 1990s that Douglas starts to get read in the classroom. And uh, he needs to be read by everyone today to appreciate uh, the significance of what he and what other African Americans have been up against, but also the potential, the possibility. And specifically, in the largest sense, what language can do for an individual and for a society. Douglass's writings and his portraits describe selves and societies that are not fixed, but that continually evolve and are in a state of constant flux. He was the most photographed American in the 19th century. I discovered this with my friend and co-author Zoe Trod. More separate photographs of Douglas than of Lincoln, of Grant, of Custer, of Whitman, of anyone else, which means he's the public face of America in the 19th century, and then virtually ignored uh, in the 20th century. He was also, as I said, one of, considered one of the great writers and orators. And Douglas understood the self not just himself, but the ideal self as someone, man or woman, who is in a state of continual flux or evolution. And that ideally would, was also a society or nation. And for him, this self that was continually evolving and a nation that continually evolved exploded the very ideas or definitions of both slavery and racism. Because slavery is based on this idea that there is a very low ceiling above which some people cannot rise. It's in the largest sense what slavery is. And racism, among other things, is based upon the understanding that one group of people is permanently superior to another group of people. And for Douglas to embrace this sense of self that's continually evolving in a state of flux, it explodes those definitions. And it means that someone like Douglas can start his life as a slave and become among the most famous Americans. And in fact, in my view, I wrote a book on this. He, with Lincoln, are the two preeminent self-made men in the United States in the 19th century. Started from nothing. Lincoln was referred to as poor white trash. He wasn't a slave. Douglas started worse off. And significantly for Douglas, what self-making meant, what a self-made man, and he also championed self-made women because he was one of a foremost women's rights activist. 
And what a self-made man or self-made woman meant for Douglas was not what most people think of it to mean today, which is someone who rises up to get rich. For Douglas, the true self-made man or self-made woman was someone who, as you evolve, as you rise up, you seek to improve and reform your society. In essence, the true self-made man or self-made woman was an activist, a reformer. A radical, as you radically evolve up, you also improve and transform your society. The ideal of which is that you create this democratic, egalitarian society. And indeed, who Frederick Douglass was, virtually in each decade, was very different than what it had, he had been in the decade previously. Hence the need to publish three autobiographies. It's outdated. The first one's outdated 10 years later. Indeed, in 1845, when he publishes his, his, the most widely read narrative, he is a member of Ameri the William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society, which advocates pacifism, which advocates non-resistance, which calls the Constitution a covenant with hell and an agreement with death because it continences slavery. Garrison famously burned the Constitution, and it advocates disunion with the understanding, and here Garrison was right, that disunion, if there's actually disunion, that's the death knell of slavery, because slavery is allowed to expand because Southerners, the aggressive Southerners, demand the capitulation of Northern whites to maintain this two-party system. And Douglas, ironically, as a pacifist, in his 1845 narrative, the turning point in that narrative, for many of you, you know the book, the turning point is his famous fight with Covey, with Edward Covey, who Douglas turns into one of the most famous villains in world literature. Covey has become like Dickens's Fagin, a villain that is just is so rich and so horrible that it's a very pleasurable, in a sense, to read because Douglas masters him. In fact, after this fight with Covey, said, with Covey, Douglas famously said he, that Covey was mastered by a boy of 16, and it's the turning point in his life. He characterized it as a, a turning point in his career. From that moment forward, he... His life's mission, in a sense, is clarified of ending slavery and racism. Uh, following that fight, he says, I, was, I, became a true man, a, I became a free man in form, even if I would be a slave, in fact. And so this fight also captures the sense of, in which Douglas is uncomfortable as an advocate of nonviolence. And indeed, and by 1855, 10 years later, when he publishes his second autobiography, my Bondage and My Freedom, it is a truly revolutionary text. It's an autobiography that is not necessarily appropriate for reading and quoting in a courtroom like this because he is an, a staunch advocate of militancy and of demanding an immediate end to slavery and racism. So, for example, Douglas, he, he edited and published the longest running African American newspaper in the United States. And this is just representative of many of his columns in the 1850s. It's 1854. It's in the response uh, to the Anthony Burns fugitive slave case, which many of you are no, even know of. And Douglas titles his essay. Is it right and wise to kill a kidnapper? He's referring to James Batchelder, who is, becomes a uh, part-time policeman who is uh, armed to protect the courthouse. And uh, he was killed because abolitionists stormed the courthouse. And Batchelder tried to, he pulled out his gun uh, and uh, one of the abolitionists killed him as to protect uh, a fellow abolitionist. Uh, and it was part of the attempt to free Anthony Burns, which they did, were not able to do. 
And Douglas answers that question, is it right and wise to kill a kidnapper by saying, yes, it is. Yes, it is, if the aim is to protect a life of a fugitive. In another essay, he characterizes, he says that the, e that e the easiest way to make the fugitive slave law a dead letter is to kill a few more slave catchers. And in his 1855 autobiography, he says, if a slave kills his master, he imitates only the heroes of the revolution. A slave who kills his master should be celebrated, truly celebrated, like the revolutionary heroes who also fought and were willing to die for the ideals of freedom and equality. Douglas, at this point, had reinterpreted the Constitution now as an anti-slavery document. And in this sense, he, he anticipates a progressive understanding of constitutionalism today in which he saw the Constitution not based on its original intent, not based on originalism, but he said this is a document that's a living, breathing, forward-looking document. And because he says the preamble emphasizes that its function is to preserve the blessings of liberty and the fact that the Constitution never mentions the word slave, slavery, or Negro, this forward-looking, living, breathing document cannot countenance something as dehumanizing as slavery, especially when this document emerges out of, the, out of the Declaration of Independence, that we can only understand this document in, next to the Declaration. In this sense, Douglas uh, was one of the first human rights advocates, and in fact, he redefined the abolition movement as a human rights movement as well as a civil rights movement. And then in the 1860s, one of his close friends, in fact, he, they defined publicly called themselves friends, was Abraham Lincoln. In fact, he becomes the first African American to meet with and advise a U.S. president. He met with Lincoln three times in the White House. They publicly declared themselves friends at a time in which friendship meant equality. Today it means giving money to museums. <laughs> then it had much more cultural significance. And Lincoln, in the third meeting with Frederick Douglass, in fact, you can see the meet, you can see Douglass as the images are scrolling, as the photographs of Douglass are scrolling down. One of the photographs by Alexander Gardner of the second inaugural shows, I've circled Douglass. You see Douglass literally, ha he has a front row seat, and Lincoln sees him in the audience when he gives his second inaugural address. And Douglas is invited to the White House reception afterwards. And when he enters the elegant East Room, Lincoln sees Douglas enter and he raises his long arm and he says, in front of this crowd of hundreds of whites, he says, here comes my friend Frederick Douglas. I saw you in the crowd today. And it's very clear that he did because you see how close Douglas is to Lincoln. Saw you in the crowd today. What did you think of my inaugural dress? There's no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. You can't ask for a better commendation. And Douglas responds, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. They would have met on numerous other occasions, but Douglas had such a busy speaking schedule. He also had a policy that he would never re repudiate or uh, back down from a speech because of another engagement. And then following in the postbellum period with the truly revolutionary transformation of the Constitution with the Reconstruction Amendments, Douglas is now able to fully embrace the Constitution and no longer stand outside of it directly. In one sense, you could say Douglas in the 1850s is like a Black Power Stokely Carmichael or a Black Panther because there are certain parts of the law 
that do not continence the freedom and equality of African Americans. And then by, after the, the Reconstruction Amendments, he becomes a true constitutional figure and uh, a advisor to every subsequent president until his death in 1895 and the first African American to receive a federal appointment requiring Senate approval, a Republican insider. At a time in which the Republican Party would be like the very progressive wing of the Democratic Party today for reasons that I can easily explain. The quote which Judge Woodlock did not want to state, uh, which is beautifully engraved outside, I'm going to because it's a magnificent statement from Douglas. It comes from his 1886 speech on uh, this, the role of African Americans in American society. And Douglas writes, in 1886, where justice is denied and any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Meaning the, the, the Constitution itself becomes essentially meaningless if you deny justice to any one class of people. Douglas took advantage of the new technology of his day in much the same way that activists take advantage of the new technology of our day. I'm thinking in particular of the rise of Black Lives Matters in which activists are very drawn to Twitter and Facebook and cell phone photos and videos. And as the most photographed American in the 19th century, Douglas recognized the truth value of the camera. That in a sense, the camera doesn't lie, even though we know in theory that it can. Which is why increasingly African Americans, many of them won't leave home without a camera. Because if they're accosted by the police, they, have, they can document that interaction. Douglas's words and his visual legacy in the 20th and 21st century continued to resonate in the 20th century mostly for African Americans. Murals, you see Douglas murals throughout African American communities all over the nation. And beginning in the 1980s murals in even white communities as well. Douglass's words and his visual legacy protested lynching and segregation in the 20th century and 21st century. It's lobbied for civil rights and it's celebrated black power. It has dignified the black body that white Americans have so often tried to destroy, according to Ta-Nehisi Coates. More than virtually any other 19th century figure, Douglas recognized the degree to which language could be power and could be used as power and the degree to which words can become among the most potent weapons. Throughout his autobiographies, throughout his speeches, when you see him posing, he had two signature poses that he developed, this look that stare, where he stares right at the viewer which one convert to the cause of anti-slavery says that he is majestic in his wrath. I think it's a great phrase. Douglas is majestically wrathful, understandably from 1850s through the Civil War. And then he has the profile pose. It's the visionary gazed elder statesman. And that's his, the pose in the post-war period. Uh, he portrays himself through his autobiographies, through his speeches, through his poses as a performance artist. Language in the sense of performance being used to break down racial barriers. One of my famous lines from Douglas refers to the idea of a picture maker, whether it's in photography or whether it's with words, with speeches or his autobiography in which he says, Poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And this ability is the secret of their power. They see what ought to be by the reflection of what is 
and endeavor to remove the contradiction. It's a wonderful encapsulation of the distinction between the ideal and the real and the true activist. In a sense, Douglas is saying the true American is seeking to realize one's ideal. Whether it's realize the, the, the constitutional ideal of the Declaration, the values of equality, universal equality and freedom in the Declaration, or other ideals. The most enduring legacy of Douglass's writing, speeches, and portraits, I think, is that they highlight the degree to which the language, as either word or image, itself can become a mode, first, of liberation, but also then as a source of hope, as a strategy of escape, and ultimately as a form of power and of an insistence on equal rights. Douglas described with great beauty and power the transformation from ignorance to erudition, from darkness to light, from being lost to being found, from slavery to freedom, from barbarism to civility, from corruption to decency. Especially now, I hope that Douglas will encourage each of you, each new generation of readers to discover through his stories, their own stories, to find through his words, their own source of strength and inspiration, and to seek through his imagery, their own swift-winged angels that move merrily before the gale, as Douglas said. Thank you. I'm Marita Rivero, so I'm the Executive Director of the Museum of African American History. It's on 46 Joy Street, uh, kind of behind the State House, uh, and I hope you'll put it on your list of places to visit. It's just unique in the country. Most such meeting places for African Americans were torn down, uh, you know, bulldozed over, uh, broken, lost. So in Boston, we're just fortunate that the African Meeting House it has been preserved. It was on Beacon Hill, which in the 17 and 1800s was the black community, was the hood. Uh, and of course, we didn't have a huge plantation. People weren't coming together. They needed a place to meet. And in 1806, built the African Meeting House. Uh, so I invite you to come and walk into and experience a place that was so seminal in American history, that last push toward abolition. Uh, and who was there? Douglas. So you're walking on the same floor as Douglas walked on. You're, you're in the place Douglas used to recruit the Black Civil Rights Regiment, the 54th, the famous 54th. He traveled to Ohio, he traveled all over New England, and they came to 46 Joy Street. So I invite you to make that part of something you do. We have programs, we have events. Uh, hope when people are out of town visiting you, you'll come. Uh, we'd like to see you there. Uh, and we'd like, you to put you, we'd like to put people in touch with this exhibit that's going to be up this year. Um, that really represents the work Douglas did. Part of what we do is represent, try to represent the full human being. So you're going to see Douglas, the baseball player, Douglas, the violinist, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but come and experience that exhibit. The other thing that's important to the museum, however, is speaking to our current time. How do we use these stories, these lessons, these ideas, certainly from someone as prolific and profound as Douglas, to help us understand who we are and who we intend to be and what our obligations are. Uh, and that's really where we're going to turn at this time in our program. There's a wonderful panel here uh, ready to explore uh, many of the issues and ideas that spring out of, out of this person, out of Mr. Douglas. Uh, and we are going to just begin with, with our professor from Emerson uh, College, with Jabari and, and um, move, uh, rotate then through the panel for about five minutes. Everyone will have a chance to just speak a bit, put some ideas on the table, and I'll be back, and I hope to have us talk more about that and other things, uh, try to include you. We only, we'll have half an hour, but we'll do the best we can. So thank you so far, and begin to think about the now. That's where we are. Jabari. Douglas's narrative, published in 1845, was a seminal volley in what the great African-American novelist Richard Wright would call a battle over the nature of reality, and what I like to call narrative combat. 
the clash of competing stories that continue to challenge and define our experience in these United States. In that context, Douglas is seen as a pioneer in a tradition of eloquent black protests that often consists of the following components. Illumination, in which the speaker outlines the social, political, and economic condition of black people. Advocacy, in which the speaker proposes or outlines a plan to improve those conditions. Instruction, which usually emphasizes the responsibility of individual citizens to enable their own uplift. Hope, which previews what life will be like after conditions are improved. And conciliation, which describes the widespread peace and harmony that will inevitably result when the other improvements are accomplished. Language is also a political instrument, means and proof of power. James Baldwin observed. It is the most vivid and crucial key to identity. It reveals the private identity and connects one with or divorces one from the larger public or communal identity. When those whom language has been used to oppress begin to use that language to challenge that oppression and its attendant stereotypes, complications inevitably follow. In the or oratorical tradition to which Douglas belongs, black language is often prompted by brutal necessity, or more precisely, as a response to brutality. Speech, as the actor rapper Most Deaf describes it, becomes a hammer. Not a bludgeon, mind you, but an instrument of power and leverage a carpenter's tool useful in constructing arguments that can withstand the buffeting forces of ignorance, suspicion, and ridicule. Against such forces, Douglas and his long and eminent line of intellectual descendants have almost constantly engaged in storytelling as a form of resistance. This particular aspect of Douglas's oratory resonates most strongly in the movement for black lives galvanized by the killings of Oscar Grant in 2009 and Trayvon Martin in 2012. Like Douglas, Black Lives Matter activists have shown a sophisticated understanding of the power of narrative capital. As critical to our well-being as intellectual capital, economic capital, and social capital, they understand that the person who shapes and controls the narrative shapes and controls nearly everything. Just as Douglas and Martin Delaney created the North Star to counter the narrative of white supremacy and injustice, Black Lives Matter activists took to the internet to counter the narrative aggressively perpetuated by police departments and complicit media. Via Twitter and Facebook, through a combination of text, testimony, and video footage, they presented raw, unfiltered, ground-level eyewitness reports of unrest in the turbulent streets of Ferguson, Baltimore, and elsewhere. While organizing and participating in protests in Ferguson following Darren Wilson's killing of Mike Brown in 2014, activists DeRay McKesson and Janetta Elzey created Hashtag This Is The Movement, a curated newsletter of tweets, articles, and photographs that kept more than 8,000 subscribers updated with the newest, most accurate information. At the same time, McKesson operated a texting service that had more than 14,000 subscribers. Since then, McKesson has teamed with other activists in the movement for black lives, including Brittany Packnett and Clint Smith III, to create Pod Save the People a regular conversation around activism, social justice, culture, and politics. And the book-length narratives have begun to follow, most recently with When They Call You a Terrorist, a memoir by Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Kahn Cullors, written with Asha Bandele that was published last month. Con Colors connects current activists to groups like Louisiana's Deacons for Defense, who, like Douglas, recognized that power concedes nothing without a demand. We were 
and are their progeny, she writes. She undoubtedly recognizes the truth of another of Douglass's durable observations. In the struggle for justice, he writes, the only reward is to be in the struggle. Thank you. We Americans tell ourselves a better history than we deserve. Nowhere is this more true than the version most of us learned about Boston in the decade before the Civil War. The popular history is one of an unbroken line of anti-slavery action from the prophetic abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison to the courageous Charles Sumner literally fending off a Southerner's blows to the heroic Robert Gould Shaw Jr fallen leader of the 54th Regiment. In the words of one historian of Boston, Garrison was the voice, Shaw was the arm. Richard Henry Dana's first biographer, Charles Francis Adams Jr., had a different view. Of Boston in the decade before the Civil War, Adams wrote, social and business Boston was in its heart and almost avowedly a pro-slavery community. And so it remained until 1861. It was a time, said Ralph Waldo Emerson, when judges, bank presidents, railroad men, men of fashion, and lawyers universally all took the side of slavery. Richard Henry Dana Jr. was one of uh, the elder, was the eldest son of one of America's most distinguished families. Dana's perspective was profoundly altered when, as a 19-year-old Harvard dropout aboard the Brig Pilgrim, he witnessed the brutal floggings of his shipmates by a captain who declared you are all Negro slaves. He became, wrote Adams, counsel for the sailor and slave. In the mind of wealthy and respectable Boston, almost anyone was to be preferred to Dana. On a Saturday morning in February 1851, the 35-year-old Dana was working in his office next to the Boston courthouse. A lawyer rushed in to tell him that the US Marshal had seized an alleged fugitive slave. Dana went immediately to the federal courtroom then housed in Boston's courthouse. Armed deputies surrounded a young man in a waiter's apron. With him was the remarkable Robert Morris, only 28, but already a leader of Boston's African-American community. Morris told Dana that the young man, Frederick Menkins, called Shadrach, had been seized while working in a Boston coffee house. Massachusetts Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw refused to entertain Dana's habeas petition but as Dana returned to his office, he heard what he described as a shout from the courthouse, continued into a yell of triumph. African Americans had freed Shadrach. Six days later, he was in Canada. The escape precipitated a national crisis. President Millard Fillmore called an emergency meeting of his cabinet. Secretary of State Daniel Webster threatened to resign if Fillmore did not use federal authority to arrest and prosecute aiders and abettors of the escape. No man in the cabinet stands up for the South in a manner more prompt than Mr. Webster, reported the New Orleans newspaper. Ten Bostonians, black and white, prominent and obscure, were arrested for violating the Fugitive Slave Act. The law had been passed six months before as part of the Compromise of 1850. It was the most draconian statute ever enacted into American law. Daniel Webster believed if he could enforce it in Boston, he would be the next president of the United States. The United States government would spend the next two years prosecuting what became known as the rescue cases. The U.S. attorney was directly accountable to the Secretary of State. The Department of Justice was not established until after the Civil War. In the first rescue case, Dana's cross-examination shredded the government's primary witness, and the judge dismissed the indictment. It was a stunning setback for the prosecution. Webster's agents seized a second fugitive from, Boston, from a Boston street six weeks later in April 1851. 23-year-old Thomas Sims was imprisoned in the Boston courthouse, which was filled with armed troops and literally encircled in chains. Sims was transported back to Savannah, where he's flogged nearly to death in the public square. Webster triumphantly reported the news to President Fillmore, who responded in kind. I congratulate you and the country on the triumph of law in Boston. She has wiped out the stain of the former rescue. Frederick Douglass had another view. Daniel Webster has at, law, has at last obtained from Boston a living sacrifice to appease the slave god of the American Union. 
Dana's father wondered why it was that not a man of weight will assist my son against the wealth and rank of this overbearing city. The men of weight were all on the other side. Webster used his immense stature as a lawyer to press his cause. The act of taking away Shadrach was clear treason. I say it everywhere on my professional reputation. It was treason and nothing less. When a vacancy arose on the US Supreme Court in October 1851, Webster offered the position to Rufus Choate, the leader of the Boston Bar. When he declined, Webster turned to Benjamin R. Curtis, who had worked with Choate to ensure that Thomas Sims was sent back to slavery. Webster orchestrated the appointment not because he needed Justice Curtis on the Supreme Court, but because he needed Judge Curtis in Boston. In one of history's more remarkable letters of acceptance of a judicial appointment, Curtis wrote to President Fillmore, I received from the Secretary of State a commission as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. After a perfunctory expression of thanks, Curtis advised Fillmore to renew judicial assignments as there is a trial in Boston at which my presence is very desirable. Three days later, Curtis took office as the presiding judge in Boston's federal court. The case on which Judge Curtis was to sit was United States of America versus Robert Morris. In 1851, there were 24,000 lawyers in the United States. Robert Morris was one of three African-American attorneys, the first to try a case before a jury. Dana was appalled with the US attorney's treatment of Morris. In an exchange with the federal prosecutor, Dana said, when one by his own industry and ability has raised himself to the dignity of a place in this bar, it was with mortification I heard him insulted as the little darky lawyer. It was with deep regret that I saw the representative of the United States government lead the laughter of the audience against him. Dana's defense of Morris began with the argument that the initial warrant for the arrest of Shadrach was invalid because there was no proof that he was a slave. The US attorney chose to prove Shadrach was a slave through the testimony of a Virginia police officer, John Caphart, who testified he had seen Shadrach sold. When Dana arose to question Officer Caphart, Dana later wrote, someone in the room gave me a hint of the occupation of many of these so-called policemen, which led to my cross-examination. And here I quote directly from the transcript and use a word that uh, is never appropriate in either public or private. Question, Mr. Caphart, do you flog slaves at the request of masters? Answer, certainly when I'm called upon. Question, I suppose you flog women and girls as well as men. Answer, women and men. Mr. Caphart, how long have you been engaged in this business? Answer, ever since 1836. Question, how many Negroes do you suppose you flogged in all, women and children included? Answer, looking calmly around the room, and that's from Dana's notes, I don't know how many niggers you've got here in Massachusetts, but I think I have flogged as many as you've got in this state. Robert Morris was acquitted, but I doubt he would be surprised today at the black community's distrust of the American criminal justice system. Neither, I think, would Dana. Of how we tell American history, Tahisi Coates writes, there's some passing acknowledgement of the bad old days, which by the way, were not so bad as to have any ongoing effect on the, on the present. But even today in this magnificent federal courthouse, as many here know far better than I, the past is always present. Thank you. I um, wanted to um, mention that today though, I'm going to talk to you based not on my role as chief judge, but on my past experiences as chair of the United States Sentencing Commission between 2011 and 2017. Frederick Douglass wrote in his autobiography, by the way, which I never read before, and I, this gave me the occasion to read it, um, that one of his autobiographies, um, that the goal of slavery was to reduce man to the level of the brute, to obliterate the sacredness of the family as an institution, and to do away with fatherhood. Today, of course, we no longer have slavery, but we do have mass incarceration, a very different problem, but one which poses many of the challenges with respect to the family unit, the community, and the individual.
So just to give you a description of what the Sentencing Commission that I used to chair, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them, based on my own experiences there, the Commission issues sentencing guidelines which govern the sentences in all federal courts. It also does statistical research about racial and other demographic disparities in sentencing. So I was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the Senate when, when I went in in 2011. I became the chair when the United States was the world's biggest jailer as a result of surging prison populations at the local, state, and federal levels. In about 2016, the federal prison population peaked at about 217,000 people. Over half of the federal prison population there was there because of drug penalties, harsh mandatory minimum penalties. While I was chair, the commission um, addressed the drug, um, got the drug guidelines and the drug penalties, and uh, we made it uh, over 40,000 offenders eligible for reduced sentences uh, of an average about 25 months. But that was not enough. You may remember at one point a couple of years ago when 6,000 people walked out of prison on November 1st. Um, I, I didn't time it for Halloween. No, I didn't. But, <laughs> but they did come out in, um, on, on that date. So today I'd like to address in particular the impact of mass incarceration on the minority population. Uh, nationally, about one out of three black males will be caught up in the criminal justice system. I'm sure you've heard that statistic before. And so I'd like to try and address why there has been such a harsh impact on the black community. And it's, it, there really is no simple answer. Some of the reasons include policing, prosecutorial charging decisions, and tough mandatory um, sentences, and of course, national policy. The most notorious was the so-called 100 to 1 crack powder ratio. Um, which was fixed a little bit um, in 2010, reducing it to um, uh, 18 to 1. Let me just say that that was for people who work here knew that, but crack and cocaine powder are very similar drugs, but one's cooked and the other isn't, and one is um, used often by or sold often by African Americans. Well, that meant um, if you can think about five sugar packets, you know, that you, you drop in your coffee, if you sell that on the street corner, you used to get a mandatory five years. Nothing a judge could do, mandatory five. If you did it a second time, mandatory ten, or at least it could be charged that way. So that has been fixed a little bit, but what wasn't fixed is making that retroactive. So um, even though the sentences have been reduced, and actually this is a 65% drop, um, under um, Attorney General Holder and, and the number of crack prosecutions, um, there are still thousands of people in prison based on the old sentencing scheme. So that was the, the policy I think the most people knew about. Um, the reform, um, the commission found also, that when we looked at all the sentences, that black male federal offenders on average have received sentences 19.1% longer than similarly situated white male offenders. A key reason for this uh, is a lower likelihood of receiving what we call variances below the guideline range. Higher percentages of blacks receive the drug enhancements that sometimes double, treble, and otherwise um, um, are, have a, constitute a higher percentage of career offenders. In fact, about 60% of career offenders are African American. And about 70% of them are there on, tr on drug um, violations. I could go on and on, but I will say that at least at the federal level, about 13% of the population as a whole is African American, but it's about 37% of the non-immigrant um, Bureau of Prisons population. I say that because um, we have so many people who are there on for immigration violations that that you have to that that's a different uh, category. But on on other kinds of crimes, it's 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 that ratio about 13 percent to 37 percent. And this is just not a federal problem. I want to mention that in Massachusetts, I recently looked at the statistics from the Massachusetts Sentencing Commission. According to the state Sentencing Commission statistics, African Americans are incarcerated at a rate of um, 655 per 100,000 people, which is about eight times the rate of, of, of white. So that's in, in our state. Because of these stunning statistics about mass incarceration, the last Congress became active. 
and they became active in a bipartisan way on both sides of the aisle, whether it was Senator Cornyn or Senator Grassley or whether it was Senator Leahy or Senator Durbin, there was a bipartisan consensus that reforms were needed. It was just too harsh. Unfortunately, and it's one of my big regrets when I left, the bill came very close to passage and didn't. Uh, ultimately, we need statutory changes to some of these um, sentences, particularly in the drug world. As you know, um, President Obama um, granted clemency, I would say, to about 1,700 people, many of them largely nonviolent um, drug offenders. And under um, uh, President Obama and I would say Attorney General Holder, the racial disparities lessened somewhat for reasons, for example, fewer uh, crack prosecutions and, few, and, and, and the use of um, lower, not charging the mandatory minimum except in the most serious cases. I haven't given up hope for congressional action, and I hear there's still some movement. I called just yesterday, I say, is there hope? And, and yes, there is, because there, there is a markup going on, and there's some support from the White House, actually, in trying to deal with better prison reform programs, giving you credit in prison for some of the programming. But I, I want to say that um, I can't predict what's going to happen uh, in Congress. But what I can talk to you about are the various programs in this court and in the courts across the country is judges are searching for ways to, to address issues of um, people coming um, out of prison and indeed trying to divert people from prison. Uh, I, I, once again, I, I quote Frederick Douglass, um, and he really his words are inspiring. I, I, I got a chance to read Professor Stauffer's book, you know, Prof, um, Judge Anastoy's book. I, I, it was a great reading assignment for me. And, but one of the things that uh, Douglas said is, by the cultivation of the intellect, by the development of his natural resources, by understanding the science of his own relations to the world, man has the marvelous power of enlarging the boundaries of his own existence. And I'll sort of now add after Professor Stauffer said that, men and women have the marvelous power of enlarging the boundaries of their own existence. It's the ideal self. Basically, never give up hope and never give up trying to um, uh, work with people. So what we have here in this court is the CARE program for people with drug addiction problems. And I will say about 40% of people in the Bureau of Prisons have serious drug addiction problems. I shouldn't say drug, substance abuse disorders. It could be alcohol or drugs. Uh, we have the Restart pe pro um, program for more serious offenders who come out. We try and give them job training and try and help them reintegrate back into the community. And we have a program which is brand new called the RISE program. We've only had maybe between 25 and 30 people in the program, but it's done a great job in um, getting people um, to understand the harm of their actions and actually getting them jump-started in life again. The young woman that um, was mine, if I will, uh, came out. She was, she was a drug courier for her boyfriend, and uh, she came out and went to college and now is working two jobs. So, so, so we're hoping that we'll be able to do more of that. A long time ago, this is also the 50th anniversary of the Johnson Commission, um, crime has been a problem and I don't think we can just have this discussion without talking about issues of guns and drugs and violence. Crime's been a problem since the 60s and it skyrocketed in the 60s and the 70s. And I, I like the way that the, the Johnson Commission really addressed it better than what we've done recently. They did call for sentencing guidelines so there's less disparity in sentencing. They did call for tough sentences on the person who keeps offending. But they basically said that the key was to attack poverty and to attack um, and to really deal with the core issues of um, crime and, and in the recent years I'm, I'm glad you know when I was working with Senator Kennedy back in the day in that sentencing reform bill you know people almost never talked about rehabilitation viewed as that liberal pipe dream let's just you know it, it didn't work Let, let's get on with the more punitive aspects of it I, I think we've moved back again I think the p pendulum has swung um, and so while crime has lessened um, uh, really we're at a lower rate of violence than, than we've been for a long time I, I realize we have the, the opioid crisis but, but in terms of violence, the statistics are still lower than they were. I hope that we're learning that there are many approaches to dealing with the problems of crime, and it's really not just a question of incarceration. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, I was interested that we, we began, uh, began this uh, afternoon by thinking about the courthouse itself. Uh, this is a public building. I think it might be the only public building, actually, in this new, new area of town that's developing. And um, one thinks it has a special role, may have a special role, in really connecting to its own surrounding community. Uh, 
uh, as well as those who come to visit. Uh, and I wonder whether you could say a few a few words about how you feel um, that should be opened up. Patty, thank you for, for ending, really, with that kind of list of ways in which we're connecting. I, I don't know whether people know all of that, uh, so it's helpful to hear that. Uh, but as you look at a courthouse in a community, uh, this panel, what do you see as its, its uh, opportunity? It's funny, when we, when we moved here, I said we're going we're gonna to have classes and we can bring school children in and we're going to have forums like this one and I somebody said to me the only way you're getting me into the courthouse is with a subpoena <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've gone beyond that I, I really do I mean we've had many programs here we've we've brought in I don't John probably knows the exact number uh, thousands and thousands of, of, of school how, how many uh, it's over a hundred thousand th school children have been brought in here so so and the I, the other day, spoke at, at John, uh, Discovering Justice request to a group of school teachers because guess what? Civics and social studies are coming back into the public schools in Boston, right. Right. which is fabulous. Right. And so I spoke to a bunch of school right. teachers trying to talk to them about our history. Right. Interestingly, their biggest interest wasn't even the mass incarceration stuff. It's the things they're dealing with in their courthouse or the immigration issues, uh, sure. excuse me, in their classrooms, right. uh, the immigration issues. But, but what we're doing is we're trying to talk about the rule of law. We're bringing in students into each of the, the trials, and I, I just had um, match school. I don't know if anyone here. They, they, they all came running in, and they all sat in the jury box, and they and so so that the students are experiencing the courthouse, understanding the importance of being on a jury, uh, understanding the um, importance of the rule of law, and these programs I think are are terrific as as well. We we try and bring people in in the um, afternoon for various ones. We have one in South Africa. I mean, we've had various ones over the years. So I don't know if that. Uh, well, just from a state perspective, first of all, I was just uh, uh, struck by and want to thank uh, Judge Woodlock for, uh, we had a pre-meeting here a, a couple of weeks ago, and I was just uh, very impressed by, uh, by his passion for this building and for uh, what it stands for. Um, just from a little bit different perspective in, in, a, uh, in, in the state of Vermont, where we, our courthouses are. Of course, they're state courts houses and much uh, smaller. This issue of what a court should stand for and access to the public is one we had to deal with. Where, and I think, unfortunately, for a while in the uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, in the issue uh, in the uh, in, uh, wishing to in the interest of so-called economies, uh, we had several undistinguished courthouse buildings that folded in uh, the social and rehabilitative services and uh, Department of Pro uh, Probation and, and all the rest. And that, I think, stepped away from um, the courthouse as a symbol of, uh, of the community. And really, if you come to Vermont and look at uh, the, the old courthouses on the Greens, um, they really stood for something and meant something uh, to the public at large. And I think, um, Certainly here, um, as uh, Marita said, this may be the last public building here in this entire section, and you want that uh, to stand for some some openness. This is your green, if you if you will. Uh, I I think it was uh, John. <laughs> John who talked about self-made man uh, mm -hmm. and women, uh, but the obligation to reform yeah. uh, and to create. Uh, 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 a new democracy, our view of democracy. I mean, I would, um, I should, I'd also like to just to thank Judge Woodlock and to John Spack as well because of their understanding of the degree of the huge significance of the relationship between past and present. And it's immensely heartening for me to be outside this courthouse and from a half a block, even with good eyes, from a block away, you can still, you can read that extraordinary inscription by Frederick Douglass from 1886, which is explicitly connecting past to present as you approach. And to understand the, this court today, is, it's, it's, I think, crucial to understand the, the long history. Mm -hmm. um, that has occurred. And so uh, the quote of Douglas, the quote of others, I think John Benson, uh, Judge uh, 
uh, Woodlock is correct if you actually spend time with, uh, uh, with engravings. It, they're extraordinary. They're extraordinary works of art. So it's, it's both the form and the content of these words inscribed in the courthouse intimately connects past and present in ways hopefully that can inspire us. Well, I'd say about those words, uh, Jeffrey, you talked about the truth, connecting past and present, and our, our interest in really uh, presenting a truth we like right now as opposed to uh, what might have in fact happened. Uh, this idea that Boston was pro-slavery is simply not something we walk around with in our heads. Uh, so if we're talking about connecting past and present, we're charging ourselves in a way with, uh, with bringing a new story forward, I would say, right? If we're going to understand what we're doing right now. And um, I heard that in you, and I heard Jabari uh, talking about speech as a hammer. And I wonder whether we could kind of explore those ideas. I, I didn't have a direct uh, comment to that, but I did want to follow up on the self-made men and women thing. It's a really interesting op-ed the New York Times today if you haven't seen it, by the Yale historian David Blight, which is about uh, the right's attempt to co-op the image of Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. by harping on this idea that he's a self-made man. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was new to me. I, I wasn't aware that it was going on, but it doesn't surprise me in light of similar efforts to co-op the image and legacy of, of Martin Luther King. So I right, think it's, right. it's significant on this day uh, right. that we might also reflect that shaping the narrative also involves shaping the narrative around the people who created the narrative, uh, because that gets altered and, and edited over time. Right. Yeah, and, and in terms of the narrative, I just I think uh, approaching my subject as an certainly as an amateur historian, uh, the, the, my view of Boston before the war was uh, before the Civil War changed dramatically, and. and one of, and particularly my, my view of Daniel Webster, uh, who as a result of, by the time you get to 1880, 1890, I remember being in, in the Widener Library, there are probably, I'm not exaggerating, there's probably 50 sets of volumes of Daniel Webster's speeches mm -hmm. uh, published from 1890 to 1880 to 1920. And so Webster just becomes this huge, enormous hero of, uh, Hear me for my cause, the, the man who tried to save the Union. And one of the thoughts that occurred to me, it's, it's not a cure-all, but when, it, when we talk about telling ourselves a better history than we deserve, how much it would have been helpful, it seems to me, if part of the narrative after <coughs> the Civil War was about Robert Morris. Who heard of Robert Morris, mm -hmm. right? So Robert Morris was, I mean, he is an there's mm -hmm. very little about him, an extraordinary individual. Uh, and then Dana, who represented him, uh, who was certainly from the Brahmin class, and uh, I don't want to picture him as uh, someone who was, uh, he had all the, pre the, the, the uh, prejudice of his caste, of his class and his caste, but he was written out of history primarily because uh, I think in the decade before the Civil War, he demonstrated the hypocrisy of his own class, right? And after after the war, and Dana, in fact, gives a speech to the daughters of the Brahmin class in 18, uh, 1870, 11 years after the war, and says, none of you can believe, and basically says, all your fathers were part of a, the, the pro-slavery empire. No, you, and that really, that whole history was just, was just written out. And I think if we'd had a little better, uh, tr more truthful narrative, we might be in a little better position to deal with some of the things we are trying to deal with today in terms of race relations. I'd say, have people seen the MIT uh, statements about slavery at MIT and the buildings? And who did Incredible that we've reached this point. Wonderful that we've reached this point. So there's a question. Are there other questions here that I could take as a group? I could maybe take three questions. Yeah. Um, point of personal privilege at Harvard. I was one of the undergraduate students that was in University Hall. December of 1969 to get an African American Studies department. That's right. So, I was one, so by September of 1970, we had the department. Right. I took my courses in that department. Right. Professor Asim, when I first got out of law school, Professor Brown asked me to teach African American history at Emerson. I still 
brag about teaching under the trees in the public garden. <laughs> but my question, professors, mm -hmm. at Harvard and at Emerson today, do we have any courses fully devoted to Frederick Douglass, or how many days do you spend in your courses on Frederick Douglass? If I could teach it again, I'd spend much more time on Douglass. But what are we doing today? Please. So I, uh, one of the courses I teach every year, I'm teaching it this semester, it's a seminar, uh, and it's on the writings of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, solely on the writings of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. I had thought of teaching just Douglas, uh, but I did this book on Douglas and Lincoln, and part of the reason I teach Lincoln is, uh, is that I don't have, Douglas teaches himself. In my own view, in fact, I say I consider Douglas and Lincoln to be among the two preeminent nonfiction writers in the English language, and unfortunately, they're not widely read. Uh, and, uh, and I don't have to convince the students of that. They just have to read them. And by the end of the semester, it's a, there are several African-American students, but a majority of white students, by the end of the semester, almost all of them, in fact, I've taught it for eight years, almost all of them, maybe one exception, like me, believe that Frederick Douglass is a, even a, f a more subtle and, and powerful and penetrating writer than Douglass, uh, than Lincoln is. And that's just, that's very heartening. For me, the way, I, the way that I think of teaching Douglass's writing is that he's like the American Shakespeare. If, you, if you're a British um, literary writer or scholar or critic, you, Shakespeare's like eye candy. Um, it's like giving the students candy. They, it teaches itself because he's such a beautiful writer. Douglas does the same thing for me. And then this large lecture course, which I've titled, uh, Is the U.S. Civil War Still Being Fought? And the answer is yes. Uh, and this year, it's, there are 200 students in it. Um, I teach, it's mostly primary source. Frederick, I teach, there are more, there's more on Frederick Douglass or by Frederick Douglass than any other single author. And second would be W.B. Du Bois. And I see Du Bois as a direct successor in many respects of Frederick Douglass. Du Bois uh, had a large uh, oil painting based on a photograph of Douglass in his office where he wrote. Uh, we don't have a course devoted solely to Douglas. Um, and he's taught in a course that's the history of black liberation thought, uh, which s starts with, I think, uh, David Walker, Mariah Stewart, um, Douglas, and then kind of goes forward uh, from there. Um, I teach him in the context of narrative nonfiction workshops that I teach, but also um, in areas of scholarship that I don't teach in. Like in one of my books, I traced the oratorical tradition. I talked about that a little bit here. Um, and, and look at ways that Douglas influenced African-American orators all the way up. My book ends with Obama, but it kind of very specifically traces uh, even some of the language that they've borrowed. I mean, Douglas's um, very eloquent parsing of we the people reappears in, in Barbara Jordan's historic uh, Democratic Convention uh, speech and, and then reappears in Obama's speech on race that he had to give, right? So, uh, so in class, I do kind of trace those lines, but no, we don't have a class devoted solely to him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> question over here. So that question, that question was, uh, why, what was it about Frederick Douglass's time uh, that allowed him to be seen as both the challenger, I'm going to paraphrase, but majestic, uh, uh, when today it appears that people who are following in his footsteps are not brought forward in that, in that direct way. Would that capture it? Are seen as terrorists or as uh, uh, people we should be afraid of. I want to defer to Professor Stauffer on that, but the part I would add, yeah, I, th I think that I, I share your you know, when I'm reading Douglas, I always go, how did he live so long? Which I think is what you're getting at, right? How could he do the things he did and, and not be assassinated? So, I mean, one, one answer is just pure luck. You know, pure luck. I mean, Douglas was, was almost killed while he's a slave and working as a skilled artisan in Baltimore. He had a fight with the white man. The white man just hit, almost killed him because had the... Had the blow to the forehead been an inch 
mm. in a different place, Douglas would have been killed. Then he goes, when he's a already a famous uh, abolitionist order, they go to, he and uh, black and white abolitionists are in Pendleton, Indiana. It's just this backwoods, nasty community, and they're trying to abolitionize some groups, and they, a bunch of essentially thugs come in and break up this meeting, and uh, Douglas um, sees one thug getting ready to hit uh, one of his fellow orders uh, with a, essentially a baseball bat. It's called a brick bat, and so Douglas tackles uh, the uh, white thug, and when his the other whites see that, they they want to kill Douglas, and they almost do. And in fact, one uh, one of these guys takes a, his brick bat and takes a swipe at Douglas's head, and would have almost certainly killed Douglas, but another abolitionist uh, uh, tackles him essentially, or. Um, uh, gives him a body blow, and instead of hitting Douglas in the head, the brickback breaks Douglas's right hand. And you can actually see for the rest of his life, Douglas's right hand is deformed. Uh, then in 1866, a year after Lincoln was assassinated, Douglas is giving a speech in Baltimore, and someone tried to assassinate Douglas. A bullet goes right six inches past his head. So, that, so in, that, in that sense, you know, he was lucky. He was lucky to have survived. The other thing that I would say is um, because, because there were so few other forms of public entertainment, Americans then had a far greater respect for the power of language, um, particularly as oratory. I mean, which helps explain why Douglas could com had such a presence. I mean, there are instances in which he, as an abolitionist orator, in the 1850s would go to a city and the first speech he gave would be like to five or ten people. And within five or ten days, there wouldn't be a venue large enough to hold the people waiting to see him and he'd speak on the village green to two-thirds or three-quarters of the population of that city. Uh, and so it really was like, it would be equivalent to, so if, you know, if you have Nas or, you know, name your favorite hip-hop star today. It's like, if they walk into this room, and you give an hour or two hours, there's going to be a lot more people here. <laughs> uh, but there's also competing interest. Then public speaking is truly one of the only forms. And I think there was a greater appreciation. We know that um, in the North, anyway, literacy rates were higher then than they are now. Hmm. Higher then than they are now, according to most understandings. So those are a couple let of me, Let me just get your question and get your question, and then we'll answer both of them. When and how he became a free man. I think I even know that, maybe, but uh, John, did you do that? Uh, I know my favorite story is that he walked off, he walked off his plantation in Maryland as a young 20-year-old, is he 20? His, his partner, a woman friend, and he created a sailor costume for him. And he, d in essence, walked off the plantation, got on a ship, and came to New Bedford. Uh, will that do, Professor? So he be, and then he becomes legally free when he goes to England, Ireland, and Scotland, and uh, British friends uh, purchase his freedom. They contact his owners and say, Douglas is our friend. He's worth you know, a couple thousand. Try to get him back. We'll give you a discounted price for him. <laughs> and they say, okay. There's that question, I think, part of the, the question on the table as well about our relation to the discussion of race at this time. And I often say we don't have a fugitive race, uh, slave law right now. Fugitive slave law is gone. Uh, but many people have felt that there's a version of, of that same law in effect now. And we're talking about the law and uh, how we see our stories and what we want to do about them. So is that as a final area to discuss? Can I ask the panel to comment? I would just say as to the last, I mean, one th again, one thing that, struck me on this, on this very narrow view, a narrow piece of history I was looking at was, uh, and one of the reasons for trying to draw that out today a little bit, in, in the context of the federal courthouse was, here was the most powerful political figure in the United States at the time, Daniel Webster, uh, in the most powerful aristocratic establishment in the country at the time, Boston, 
economically, socially, uh, politically, uh, using the, the entire apparatus of federal authority, the United States Attorney's Office, and then police officers. And what reverberated for me was the, the ease with which that has just, not in the, the same form, but in the, in the form of this, uh, really a century and a half or longer now, where there's no, there's no other narrative but the police officer's narrative, right? I mean, the narrative that, that the U.S. attorneys presented in the Morris case was, I mean, it's not, we're not talking about some southern place in Mississippi. We're talking about a police officer called by the United States government in the prosecution of the first, really the first black lawyer, first practicing black lawyer in the United States of America and, and with the, all the trappings of the police officers. And when the N, use, N word is used by Capart, he's looking, he's looking right at, he's looking right at Robert Morris, the lawyer, right? And he's doing it because I'm a, I'm a police officer clothed with all the authority of the United States government. So, you know, as there are, <laughs> that has implications all the way through it. And that's why, I, we, you know, I think we, we still see today this uh, residue, more than residue. Uh, and, you know, part of what Black Jabari and what we're talking about in trying to change the narrative here is, is uh, to change the narrative, to, since we seem unwilling to change the narrative of our, of our history, let's change the narrative of our, of our perspective history. I think we tend to grossly overestimate the level of, the, of intellectual and emotional and moral maturity of the country. I think we're always on the optimistic side there. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, you've probably seen these color graphs that show uh, African Americans in 1619, African Americans in 20, 20, uh, 2018, and, and showing this sort of sliding scale measuring the amount of time that we were all incarcerated versus this, this time in which we are relatively free, f freedom being very much a, a relative term. Um, and I, I think we tend to be really optimistic in terms of, you know, we, we say, why haven't we come this far, et, et cetera. I, I have not seen the evidence in my relatively short life um, that the needle has moved that much in terms of moral evolution. And also, you know, it, it's the country is so large. So I'm sitting here sort of marveling at this conversation here in Massachusetts, and, and, and we're, we're scrutinizing ourselves, and we're being self-critical, reasonably so. But at the same time, I want to say, I'm from Missouri. <coughs> this, this is amazing and impossible where I'm from. This, this discussion wouldn't take place, and it wouldn't take place in this space, for sure. So, I mean, if, if we went all the way across the country and looked at degrees of moral ineptitude where racial equality is concerned, you know, we'd have, we'd have a long way to go before we got to the bottom of the, the barrel, I think. Mm -hmm. To which Douglas would say, she asked this question, agitate, 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 right? Could we end on that note? <laughs> But we can't stop there. You know, we seem to forget that Dr. King would not have been able to give that I have a dream speech if a queer black man named Bayard Rustin had not been the principal organizer on the March of Washington. But he was erased from history for a long time because he was a gay man. And I'm saying, hey, you know, Bayard Rustin, and who was a greater writer than another gay brother named James Baldwin? who, if you just read The Fire Next Time, short, tiny book, is probably the most significant writing about what the civil rights movement was. 